Internet, you are now listening to the Free Lunch Podcast. This is your man, Premium Pete. Yeah, I'm calling from Brooklyn, and I'm letting you know that you're tuned right in. Don't go nowhere. The place to be is right here. Listen to the Free Lunch Podcast. Cheers. Yeah. Ah. Then I set the world on fire, take the block by storm, but I blow so cold. Nigga, warm your hands in the hill where the fire burn blue when the wheels turn slow when the steel. Pierce your skin, but it ain't so soft. I was raised in the veil, I prepared for a war, and my shield so tall that I don't need a hammer, and the heat don't scare me, man. This Alabama in the summer like a hammer to a runner, you gon' feel me. Go ahead, call me Green Tea Billy. Free will in your mind at the same damn time, you don't even wanna reach for the ceiling high. Listen, man, I'm the truth, won't lie. That's why I tell you, put your hand to the sky. We can live for the moment, screaming out omens like the roof on fire. Yeah. Finish the world on fire. Finish the world on fire. Welcome to the Free Lunch Finish Podcast. We are a member of the New Finish South the Movement Podcast fire. Network. I am your boy, Tight. BG, how you feeling? Like podcast, we are back at it. I'm doing good, man. How about you today? Wonderful, beautiful day outside. It's been a long day. Um, uh, the work is work has been extremely busy. Um, so much so that I'm I'm getting up extremely early. But uh, I always look forward to, to to when we have an opportunity to bring on a very exciting, interesting guest. And I think we I think we've done that again today. Yes, sir. That work thing is hard, but it's fair. But it be like that when you're a boss, man. When you're the boss, you got to get up before everybody and you go, go to sleep when everybody else is laid down for the night. So This is true. This is true. This is true. It, it is. It is. But how was your day, sir? Everything everything was good. Like you said, I mean, we, we, we do that. We do that, that nine to five, as the old people say. And then we come in and we do what we're passionate about is get on this uh, on this microphone and and have guests on here to tell stories and give testimonies that you know in my mind and and, and what i hope you know will will give some some people some energy and some uplift that they can take forward and and apply to their own day-to-day life but this is a good one man because the way that this comes out all i can say is you never know you never know you never know who's in your midst and you never know their backstory and so it's always good to have your eyes attentive and your ears wide open because you might just get hold of something that could change your life forever. And, and this, this particular episode right here will be a testament to that fact. And you have to ask questions. You have to, um, you just never know anyone's story. You never know uh, relationships that friends may have or loved ones or what, whatever the, the case may be. And, and and even for today's particular guest, a close friend of ours, BG, um, someone that we that we went to school with, um, someone that we've hung out in, uh, in in Atlanta with, and got some pretty uh, memorable stories. Uh, one in particular, um, you know, as I reflect, um, but uh, not knowing the relationship that that this particular friend and, you know, from our, that relationship have, have our guest on today. Also a big time supporter of the New South Movement, you know, podcast network, as well as contributor. He actually has yes. been on a couple of times uh, with, with one of the other shows on the network. So it's just full circle, man. Full absolutely. Circle. Absolutely. So we had GC. Uh, he he was a co-host when um, on the D1 Sports Talk podcast. Um, and and um, he's a close friend to the podcast and to the network. Well, today we have the opportunity to to interview his dad, uh, Mr. Um, Kevin uh, Loader, who um, is a retired American professional basketball player who was selected in the 1981 NBA draft by the Kansas City Kings, uh, first round draft pick. 17th pick overall, um, played the guard forward position, uh, and is from uh, and played in the NBA for three NBA seasons uh, from 81 to 84. Uh, played with the Kansas City Kings and also played with the San Diego Clippers. Um, played at the university, played at Alabama State, BG, I think will, and, and, and it has a very interesting story as to how he uh, transferred from um, 
Kentucky, Kentucky State. State. From Kentucky State to Alabama State. Um, it's from uh, Cassopolis, Michigan. Um, and no further, uh, four, 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 four sport athlete growing up in Michigan. Uh, Two time NIA All American. Uh, played high school basketball against Irving Magic Johnson. Uh, and no further ado, uh, we like to present to the Free Lunch Podcast family audience, Mr. Kevin Loader. How you doing, Mr. Loader? I'm good. I'm good, fellas. How y'all doing today? Everything good? Absolutely, good. absolutely. And it's also, I, and I didn't, and I didn't say this. I should have said this. Is the is currently the vice president of the Houston chapter of the retired. Uh, NBA Association. So that's another accolade that that we can act, uh, that we can that we can um, you know do respectfully. Uh, all is well. All is well. I uh, really appreciate you guys bringing me on. Um, always good to uh, kind of reminisce, go down uh, memory lane, and hopefully it'll help somebody. If it not, it helps me because. Uh, God was with us all the time, you know, in this journey, and um, really appreciate you uh, acknowledging my son, uh, Glennis. Uh, what a what a powerful young man he's turned out to be, and and uh, so I'm 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 grateful today. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, absolutely, Kevin. Uh, it ain't every day that you can have a representative of the National Basketball Association join you on this little podcast that we got going here. It's playoff time. Are, are you following any particular team or any particular player in the NBA right but, now? Well, you know, uh, being here in in Houston, obviously uh, a lot of the conversation is in and around uh, the Rockets, uh, James Harden for MVP. Uh, you know, we can't say enough about what Russell Westbrook has done. Uh, this year and his triple double. Um, uh, you know, I got several guys around the league that I played with that are teammates. Um, Mike Woodson is first assistant with uh, the Clippers, in which I played uh, with, uh, played against Doc Rivers. Um, Larry Drew was our point guard and with the Kings. Uh, he's an assistant with the, the Cavaliers, uh, with the Cavs. So, you know, it's, it, you know, playoff time, the, you know, the the uh, opportunity for us to create dialogue definitely intensifies, but, you know, you got to play the game. So can't nobody phone it in. We're going to see what's going to happen on the West Coast. We're going to see what's going to happen on the East Coast and uh, enjoy the ride. Question for you. So Russell Westbrook, seeing what he yeah. was – seeing what he was – what he's been able to do this season – uh, and comparing that, I mean, I, I don't know if we, if that's, a, if it's a, if it, it may not be an apples to apple comparison, but how do you compare? How do you relate his triple double season to that of the great um, uh, Oscar Robinson? Well, again, um, what, the the comparison is this: uh, the energy, the effort, the commitment, the consistency that is required for anybody before and now to be able to average a triple-double amongst the greatest players in the world on the planet is record, you know, it, it, there's a reason why people have played 16, 20 years and never done it before because it ain't, it, it's not something that you, you'll see on a common basis. So in the comparison, you know, this, those two guys being able to do that and be the only ones who have ever recorded that, that level of play is extraordinary. So I just want to take my hat off to those two. Uh, comparison, you know, uh, I just think that, you know, those efforts are just worthy of, of recognition. And we, I don't want to do any comparison. It's just amazing. You have a very interesting story growing up in – uh, Cassopolis, Michigan, um, being from the state of Michigan, what was it like growing up in Cassopolis, being able to play against a, a Magic Johnson or um, some, of, some of the greats that come out of the state of Michigan? Well, first of all, I just want to give you an A-plus for uh, 
being able to even pronounce Kasopolis. So uh, that's that's a good thing. Uh, not many folk get that right on the first try. So good job. Um, small rural community, um, basically a livestock community. I grew up on a farm. Uh, because, you know, 3,000 folks, uh, high school class of 99, uh, sports was a center point of this southwestern uh, Michigan city. And uh, obviously prideful about basketball in the state of Michigan. Uh, Magic, uh, you speak about Magic Johnson. Magic was a phenom that nobody would seen a 6'9 point guard uh, do the kinds of things that he was doing. So, um, you know, we were a uh, – things were trending. Things were trending in the, in the fact that, you know, in my little rural community, we always saw uh, sports as a way for you to pay for your education and get to the next level. Uh, collegiately, uh, even though it's a small rural community, we were putting out a lot of D1 players. So um, basketball was that that avenue. Uh, football was that avenue. Uh, baseball was that avenue. Uh, I even played uh, two years, and I was top seed on the tennis team. So, you know, I enjoyed athletics. I enjoyed sports. Uh, basketball was just simply my first love, and it was an opportunity uh, for the next level for me to pay for my education and give my parents an, an opportunity to get a break from having a because I might not have seen college if, if they had to uh, put a price tag on it and and come out of their pocketbooks. I heard or I was reading in a, in a previous um, interview that you may have done that you were actually a better football player. Well, it was an interesting story because, um, uh, you know, seventh and eighth grade, uh, ninth grade year, I, um, I played quarterback. And uh, during that particular time, uh, a lot of the coaches, uh, when we got to the high school level, uh, that was an era where, you know, uh, African Americans were not necessarily uh, adored at the quarterback position. So uh, they placed another gentleman at that position, and uh, I, I was a competitor. So I was an athlete, athlete so I went to split in. And uh, if I couldn't throw it, I definitely could catch it. So uh, I went to split in, went on to uh, be an all-stater. And when I say, when you say better, I had better collegiate offers uh, in football to D1 schools in the Mid-American Conference and, and various others than I did in basketball. Um, but uh, basketball was still my first love. But um, but I so I, that's that's what I wanted to pursue long term. One of the things that is heavily debated is should you just pick one sport and focus on it, or should you you know play the sports that you enjoy and then whatever comes out to have the best opportunity at the next level, you take that. What are your thoughts on one sport versus playing as many as you want? Uh, interesting conversation, um, and I think it's an individual kind of conversation for me. Uh, and in my era, uh, it was not uncommon to have uh, multiple sport all-staters, uh, multiple sport collegiate players. Um, I think that for me, the, the transcending part was that a lot of the uh, competitive edge, footwork, you know, uh, competition, camaraderie, team, team, team play transcended through sports. And I think that uh, an athlete can learn uh, quite a bit in, in keeping his his uh, his skills, his or her skills, very keen that way. Now uh, today, um, there's a there's a different proposition and effort, uh, but I still believe that that kids can play multiple sports. I think coaches guide them, and you know really try to you know have them more invested in any one sport. But, you know, for me, uh, I still think that multiple sports can 
uh, assist an athlete in uh, honing and developing, you know, as leaders. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone should be uh, pigeon held. You know, I think that you should explore it all. Take us down memory lane. Um, you played an all-star game. Was it with or against uh, Magic Johnson? Well, it was pretty interesting because uh, I had visited um, – Several, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michigan, Michigan State, Western Michigan. I had visited some campuses and some programs that I wanted to play for, and they were, uh, you know, uh, lukewarm in, uh, in, you know, offering me full scholarships or recruiting me, and. Uh, I knew I could play on that level, but we didn't get the kind of media coverage that the Detroit and, you know, East Lansing and Lansing guys in those particular media markets got. So, you know, the All-Star game uh, was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I uh, was uh, on the opposing team of Magic. And, you know, my role, because I was like 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six at that time, even though I had handles and, and, and different things of that nature, was I was uh, at, the, at the center position. And we had some some guards that really were all staters, supposedly, but they were having trouble against some of the Detroit guys. And um, <laughs> so I went, to, <laughs> I went to guard, and uh, and I matched up against Magic. And uh, I uh, in that particular outing, I outscored him and and uh, and held him to 18 points. Nobody had really held Magic. You know, Magic had actually, in some outings uh, during the season, he had uh, outscored uh, entire teams. He, you know, he. Uh, I know one of my um, uh, local teams, uh, and that was Class A basketball. He had 51, and the opposing team had 50. Uh, they beat him ninety-one to fifty. So he was uh, he was a, a you know extraordinary. And so uh, I think that uh, after that game, I remember going to Kentucky State. And you mentioned Kentucky State, where Coach Oliver uh, recruited me and uh, also my best friend. And uh, the uh, <laughs> when I got back from that visit. Uh, extraordinarily enough, uh, some of those other schools had found scholarship money for me, and uh, and were and Western Michigan was sitting in the driveway. But uh, the interesting part was I'd already signed with uh, Kentucky State. Uh, my vantage point at that was uh, I wanted to get to the NBA. They had put you know several guys in the NBA. So even though it was a small school environment, they wanted me, and I could get there from from Kentucky State. It sounds like Detroit was the area that had a lot of the greats to to come out, or some some pretty good players. As an All Star, um, you were you and 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 I would I would think the answer is yes, but you were already familiar with with Magic. So going into that game. Had you already put in your mind that you wanted to guard him? Well, um, I wanted to compete. I wanted to compete against anybody because my my uh, underdog mentality was that there was nobody that could outplay me. Or, uh, I mean, there were some very talented guys, but you weren't going to outwork me. And uh, and so I felt like, you know, I was going to compete with anybody. I, it didn't matter your program, your your pedigree, you know, your you know your media packet or whatever. You know, when you strapped up, I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna make you know who I you know <laughs> who you played against before the, before it's over with. You will remember my name. If you didn't know me before, that's all right. Just you know. <laughs> Put me in the game, coach, and uh, and I was gonna let you know what was going on. I knew. I, wait, let me ask you this: But were you talking smack? You know, the the thing is that that was not. Uh, uh, you know, if you talk about basketball etiquette during that particular time, um, there were guys that may, uh, you know, do that. But pretty much the the etiquette was if you had to talk a lot. When you got in the game, you was probably covering up for something that was a little bit, you know, you weren't really a player because you didn't want to get some of the guys, you know, especially when we got to the NBA, 
if you weren't backing it up and, you know, you're talking crazy to Doc or Bernard King or Isaiah or, you know, Mark Aguirre, Dominique, and you ain't getting off, you know, your, the vet's going to tell you you need to be quiet because, you know, you ain't, you ain't really can't hold your own. So you don't really get between the lines, you know, uh, and, 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 and talk a whole lot. You let your game speak for you. So that's that's the way we approached it back in the day. Now there's more, you know, you know, activity on that side, and you know, guys have other mentality about it. But you know, for me, talking a lot, Drew, you know, you know, I, I didn't have time for that. You know, time to get busy when you step between the lines. BG, the evolution of trash talking. Back then, it wasn't it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't even around then, and then something happened. Something happened. <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> Yeah, now you got that. Now you got daddies, i.e., Mr. Ball, uh, trad talking, and, and that not even not even playing. They tra- the evolution of trad talking, BG, which brings up another point. Kevin, you talked about like you had, you know, you had this vision of taking this basketball as far as you could to make opportunities for yourself and to relieve your parents. Were they putting any pressure on you and your athleticism and your participation in the sport? To get to that next level? My parents were putting uh, pressure on me to make sure that my grades were right because my mom told me that if I didn't get the appropriate grades, I didn't have to worry about athletics. I wasn't going to get a chance to play. And she proved that when I came home in the ninth grade with some poor grades and she she snatched my my eligibility. You know, I got sanctioned at home. Okay, before there was ever NCAA, so uh, so her the emphasis and the pressure was uh, that you know your education is going to take you a lot longer, and that was your A. Uh, you know, they, you know, athletics was your B selection. So you know, all, that was my emphasis was the pressure was I wanted to be good, but my parents per- was more about you know getting my education. How many of you all were growing up in in the household? Are you the only child? No, I'm the oldest of four. Okay. Uh, I have twin sisters that are uh, Kim and Karen that are uh, Alabama State uh, graduates. Uh, They were seven years younger than me. And then I have uh, a younger brother that's 10 years younger than me. And um, uh, he, uh, so I was the oldest of four. So I was setting the precedent, and I was actually the first uh, from my, you know, immediate family to uh, attend college and, uh, and you know, be able to graduate from college. So um, I was kind of trailblazing during that time. How, how did you hear about um, and how did you get recruited by Mr. Oliver to attend uh, Kentucky State? Great story as well. Um, there was a young lady that went down um, – her name is Nisi Goins, to Kentucky State. Uh, young lady uh, was first team All-American four years running at, uh, at uh, Kentucky State. And her mother went down after uh, the first year and spoke to Coach Oliver, said, we got a couple of boys back at, in Cass if you're looking for some players. And Coach Oliver came to observe us. and. Um, uh, offered us a scholarship, and uh, and uh, Glenn Hawkins, my my best friend, he and I were kind of a package deal. We went down, and I uh, got an opportunity to play at Kentucky State. Uh, Coach Oliver, Alabama State was obviously his alma mater, and after the first year, was offered the head coaching position there. And four of us transferred um, uh, down with him: uh, Melvin Creighton, uh, Johnny Mitchell. Uh, Scooter Powell, uh, Jerome Powell, and then myself. And so uh, we went uh, went on to Alabama State and had some um, some very very exciting years uh, at at Alabama State. And and I want to talk about those Alabama State years. But one question I I was wondering and kind of intrigued by was, um, did the transfer rule at that time apply? Meaning. Uh, when you all transferred from Kentucky State to Alabama State, 
Um, did you have to sit out a year, or how, how did the transfer process work back then? Transfer process then worked where uh, in the NAI small college space was that uh, you had the option of sitting out a portion of uh, the year and, you know, uh, and then we actually had to sit out 10 games. Or you could sit out the full year and gain a full year of your eligibility. But that, that so we did sit out 10 games uh, my sophomore year, and we came in, we ran the table. Uh, actually, we were 7-3 and three when we became eligible and uh, went on to uh, win, I think, uh, some that year, 19, 20 games. And we lost uh, in the district finals to Birmingham Southern. Well, coming into it, Kevin, was uh, was was Alabama State doing much in basketball at that time when you first arrived? You know, uh, it had a lot of potential, but it you know because at one time Alabama State was recognized uh, before we got there, they had uh, the largest uh, or the tallest team in the nation. They had two seven footers. Six ten, they they went seven seven foot seven foot six ten, six six guard six four. They were they were very you know they had some talent and they were gifted, but um, they didn't have the chemistry or possibly coaching to really get them over the top. And so when Coach Oliver came in, you know we we changed the culture. You know Coach Oliver was a no nonsense. He he'd been. Um, uh, Lucis Mitchell had been his mentor, and uh, you know, uh, Lucis Mitchell was a uh, you know, at Kentucky State was a a powerhouse. You know, they won uh, you know several nas national championships. So when Coach Oliver came in, he brought that that mentality of a championship and a winner uh, along with him. Real deal, because his name is on the building now. Don Oliver Akadome in Montgomery, Alabama. So, yeah, he, he's definitely right. legendary. And you speak about Coach Oliver and you um, – can you share more, I guess, in, in regards to his mentorship to you personally? Well, uh, thank you for that because um, when, you, when you speak of, of uh, great men, uh, they, they breed and they develop – greater men and that becomes a legacy of how someone begin to pour into your life where you are developed into uh, he sees more capacities than you see in yourself coach Oliver was that kind of individual he was not a coach that developed basketball players he developed successful citizens and men okay so um, you know, because the, the the lives that he touched, um, you know, you look at, you know, the, the, those men today will tell you if they sat up under and they, they had the opportunity uh, to play for him that the greater lessons were about them becoming greater men, greater citizens, greater husbands, greater, uh, you know, greater individuals, and they were able to, to give back. Uh, if you were able to get through or you stayed through uh, a Coach Oliver program, uh, you, you, you had no um, – <laughs> you, you definitely came out on the other side better because you were able to endure. Uh, a, lot, a lot of guys were not able to endure. <laughs> but I, I still say that uh, because they were a part of it, uh, they, they still came out. And he, he just – you know, just a great man, and his legacy is that, you know, uh, his fruits are still in the earth, giving back. You know, mm -hmm. many of mm -hmm. us are successful uh, today, uh, you know, in many other areas other than sports. Before before we walk down this uh, the 1979 and 80 season and and kind of talk about some of, some of your accolades during that particular those two seasons, um, let's talk about Alabama State mm -hmm. and the role that Alabama State was playing um, in the state of Alabama um, and some of the the cultural issues that were taking place in the city of Montgomery. First of all, I would say. Uh, I was a Midwestern kid, so uh, 
So um, the civil rights uh, movement and the, uh, the kinds of racism and prejudice uh, effects was only for me, I had only seen on black and white TV, so I had never experienced that level. My little hometown, six, 65, 35, predominantly white, there was a lot of interracial intermingling. So cultural shock for me was that when I, uh, you know, had to witness, you know, coming to uh, Montgomery where there were many, many civil rights activities that I was not aware of. So coming into that, that that particular period, you know, my first, uh, I guess, uh, experience was uh, Fourth of July parade where uh, I'm about 75 yards from the Capitol sitting on the side of the, uh, the street right in front of Dexter Street where, um, you know, Martin Luther King's uh, Senior's Church to witness 200 Ku Klux Klan coming in the parade in full guard, you know. So at that time, uh, a range of emotions come through me. I don't know whether to be angry, to be scared, to, should I posture to fight, should I be bracing to run, I don't know. And so the a lot of the experiences at that particular time is that um, it was a significant place and HBCUs were being viewed uh, as not valuable, not productive, not, you know, and this was this pit of place. And that was far from the truth, that we were not being recognized for our contributions to society and our contributions to the educational environment. So the devaluing uh, that happened in the media, uh, where the arguments between black and white leaders were significant every day on the 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock news, of uh, the debates that were, you know, politically driven and, and very heated. And, you know, so um, you had to know where you were, um, that there was a lot of active activists and a lot of work being going down the road for people um, of color to acknowledge that we were valuable, we were viable, and we were contributing to this society, and, um, and we were trying to, you know, and so through HBCU, you know, we had to be better than everybody else. That's a story that you hear time and time again from alumni that um, that have come through HBCUs, especially in that time, because we often forget about that period of the, you know, the the seventies into the early eighties. We always talk about the fifties and the sixties and the the blatant segregation that you saw Jim Crow on television and things like that. But we we, we tend to forget that there was still that residual. That, that even affects us now that was still there. And so there was that that embedding in the HBCU experience to, to be better, to be twice as or 10 times as good as the man that's standing next to you. And so I guess that will also cross over into this conversation that we talk about with the basketball. Absolutely. Um, what comes to mind for me, I'm here, I was able, I was invited by the, uh, uh, we have a partnership with Space Center Houston and NASA, and I was invited to the, uh, premiere of Hidden Figures, and we watched it, and um, it, it was, a, 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 you know, it is a, a, a common theme that where, you know, we were such a big contributors. And I'll talk a little bit about what Alabama State and what our program did in 7980 to contribute to uh, some of the, um, uh, you know, um, integration and the conversations and the reaching across the aisle uh, to to mend a lot of fences and get conversations going uh, in, a, in a right direction. But that's what comes to mind is that, you know, our, our contributions were not being acknowledged and we had to, uh, we had to be work, we had to work harder and uh, many of our professors and teachers uh, you know, prepared us for that. Can you share with our audience uh, regarding that se those, the, those seasons and the role that 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 you all played in regards to um, bringing awareness and using basketball um, 
for for essentially cultural to bring cultural awareness and some of the things that you all um, um, did during that period? Well, you know, um, uh, to set the backdrop, um, mm -hmm. that particular season uh, we were ranked number one in the nation all year long. We entered into uh, the national tournament 29 and one, ranked number one in the nation. So we were getting uh, a lot of awareness at that time being compared uh, to University of Alabama, Auburn, uh, South Alabama, UAB as uh, possibly the, the best team in the state because of uh, the way we played and uh, the, the level of play. So we were putting a great product on this. Um, and then we went into the national tournament that, that year. We ended up 32-2. and two. We were runners-up in the nation. Now, mind you, let me back up and say that this is not long after George Wallace, the governor, had stood in the, in the, uh, right. in the doors of University of Alabama and right. said that this university would never be integrated. There would be no blacks in there. Uh, Bear Bryant said that, you know, we'll never play, you know, African-American or black athletes. And now, um, you know, there's a different offering because, you know, the black athlete is changing the sport in every sport. It doesn't matter. Okay, but basketball and football, obviously, obviously, we're being respected at another level. Uh, and so what's, what's happening is during that 79-80 season, um, there wasn't a whole lot of discussion between uh, Alabama state officials and the state in funding. And, you know, those conversations were happening, but they were very uh, trite. They were very short. And so... Um, what I was, what was happening with me is that I was the quarterback club in Montgomery was a very prestigious uh, club of good old boys. I'm just going to put it out there: good old boys, and not many black athletes got recognized or respected. And so, um, you know, now that we're having great success and we're getting exposure nationally. Um, I'm the spokesperson, and I'm getting chosen as player of the week, player of the month, player of the year for the first time that there's a black athlete being recognized in the quarterback club. Well, right. in these particular exclusive environments, um, you know, Alabama State officials as well as, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the – the, the rank and file for the state are having lunches and talking sports, and it opened up dialogue for other things to be covered in reference and meetings to happen that really um, raised the, uh, uh, as I say, reach across the aisle because they were now proud as Alabamians to, if that's a word, uh, to to really appreciate what was happening at Alabama State and really look at us differently through sports. So mm -hmm. uh, upon uh, being runners-up in the nation, uh, um, here comes the NBA. And the NBA uh, in 1980, my junior year, offers me, the Kings offer me a uh, what we call hardship contract at that particular time for me to come out of college early, and so the NBA is now in Montgomery at Alabama State looking at mm -hmm. one of their athletes, and um, and what I did was at that time, my counsel from uh, Coach Oliver and those that I respected was that, uh, and, and, that and those two, I, I, I'll just put it out there, Coach Oliver and Dean Vaughn, uh, Dean Percy Vaughn, the, the Dean of College of Business Administration, indicated to me and helped me in, in a wise counsel that my education was something that no man could ever take away from me. So I had, you know, um, you know, weathered the storm, went to school year round for, you know, going into my fourth year so that I could graduate and graduate on time. 
and and keep my you know my GPA high. So I chose to go back to school to get my degree my senior year, and uh, that was a respectful decision that you know um, you know that a lot of the the good old boys respected, and it brought the NBA back to Montgomery and Alabama State my senior year. Uh, sometimes uh, they may have been the only white guys in the gym uh, sitting at a table that, you know. So that, you know, was a little prestigious and uh, event that um, that really brought, a, uh, you know, some, some very positive things to uh, Alabama State, to Montgomery, to the state of Alabama, because that year also uh, Coach Oliver and I were chosen – to participate in what was considered uh, a mock Olympic. That was the year that the uh, U.S. boycotted the Olympics. Uh, we went over to Sarajevo, U Yugoslavia, as a part of a team to participate in a, a, a mock Olympic competition, if you will, again, giving Alabama State and Montgomery and the state of Alabama uh, international exposure now. So, you know, there was a lot of great things written. Uh, a lot of great um, things happened from that year, and uh, and that experience. And as as you know, as we look back, you know, it was a way through sports that uh, Alabama State assisted in uh, in in having better relations with those that were in power. And um, a very prestigious thing happened. You know, it was a God thing. You know, so. Um, you know, just encouraged that I could be, and uh, and my teammates in our, our program, and uh, Coach Oliver could be a part of being a change agent through just representing ourselves with uh, integrity and character. You know, that was an amazing time for the university as well as the city of Montgomery, for sure. Yes, yes. People still talk about that team. They still talk about that time. You know, uh, you know, CJ John Arena was a place to be, and it was a rocking time. And uh, you know, you you know, if there was five thousand people in inside, there was twenty five hundred on the outside trying to get in, hope they could get in, looking in, and uh, and in the big house as we called it at that time. You know, you didn't want to see us up in there. You know, you didn't want to come up in there. Uh, you know, and and wear anything other than black and gold, because you was about to have a bad day. <laughs> what is your mom saying, and what is her thoughts when seeing her son? You know, during this period, and and what he, and the role he's playing um, on on the cultural side as well as. Um, just seeing seeing you being uh, being essentially drafted by the Kansas City Kings. What what what's going on in her head, and what is she saying to you? You know, my mom and dad, man. I want to tell you, my mom was some kind of uh, my mom. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord in '05, but her legacy still lives as well. And uh, she was so inspiring uh, because you know um, she always wanted me to do well. She she prepared us and you know um and supported us she always made made each of us feel as if we were uh, special and the only one but she, the, the the biggest thing she did when i got into the league uh whenever i would play in any proximity of my hometown and that would be chicago milwaukee detroit even indianapolis she would organize for my little hometown a bus or two of people that was coming just to see Kevin Lowe to play. And I want to tell you, you know, when you see, you know, a bus load of, you know, this ain't but 3,000 folks. So, you know, you get a, a bus of 45, 50 folk, and you get two of them, 100 folk, you didn't got, you know, a third of the folk from the hometown to come. You know, ain't nobody guarding the, the you know, the, you know, everybody didn't left. You know, so last one close the gate. That's right. That's right. That's right. Shut it down. You know, you, um, but uh, she was so so supportive, and my dad was, you know, uh, still is a this a sports fanatic, and also, uh, you know, a wonderful supporter as well. But they were they were just so prideful, 
and so proud of of what has happened and I was just uh really encouraged and they just continued to show their love. Um they were even in high school they were always at all of my contests and it was always good to see up you know, look up and see them and dad would lose his mind in the stands and uh and you know people have to calm him down because he looked like he was going to have a conniption fit but but um just very very supportive parents and i i just uh thank god for them or were they aware of what was happening and what you were doing when you were in college though Did, were they aware of the role you were playing in in montgomery and and uh some of the the segregation and relational uh cultural issues that you were addressing because of of what you were able to accomplish on the court were they aware of that you know um it's interesting you should say it that way uh i don't think i don't think so um because you got to understand that um my parents were individuals that were god fearing and just wanted uh me to be uh courteous obedient um to uh you know carry myself with uh you know uh as a, as a, as a strong young man and so it, it wasn't till later on that you know and that was also contributing to, to to coach Oliver because coach Oliver took pride once he and Coach uh, Bill Graham, his assistant, you know, he chose, you know, a uh, young man of character. You know, that was that was one of the things is, you know, you're going to have to act right around here and you're going to have to do it <laughs> not only on the court, but you're going to have to do it off the court or you wouldn't going to be there, you know. So, Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, um, those those particular times, just being, you know, we dress uh, in blazers. We uh, on the road, you know. We, you know, coach talked about how we should, uh, you know, support each other. We, you know, so we liked hanging out with each other. So we went places, and we only so, you know, the things that we did as a team were uh, were class, and so. Um, I think that more so that after the fact of how we carried ourselves, how the program was developed, the culture of a program, you know, we endured many adversities together. Uh, Coach protected us against everybody, including the administration at Alabama State. So he didn't allow anybody to, uh, you know, to really – uh, have any kind of uh, intrusion or disrespect of the program. So how we carried ourselves uh, from top to bottom, uh, how Coach Oliver, you know, led the program, um, it, it changed the whole format. Everybody had to line up with the level and uh, of integrity and character of our program, and and that raised the 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 bar and the standard for the university that, you know, there was no low jumping. You know, there was, you know, only excellence was the, was the measure. And so, you know, that, that was what changed the, the, the playing ground because we exemplified excellence throughout the program. And, and that was something that everybody could get behind and be prideful. Not everybody liked it. There were some haters, but the fact of the matter is that even through that, you know, we uh, we continued to to uh, raise the bar for and, and establish a tradition of how the program would be run for many years as Coach Oliver was was there. BG, I think the reason I asked that question and I and, and I asked it particularly because the misconception and and a lot of people take for granted that. Internet wasn't always around. There wasn't social media, wasn't cell phones everywhere. And not to say that the 80s were archaic, but at the same time, um, you know, I can remember a long distance call being, being a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and so I just wanted to add some perspective to 
it wasn't one of those situations where mom, dad could get on the internet and see see they or, or watch Sports Center and see their baby um, averaging twenty three and eight and leading leading lead, leading all scores and leading in many in many statistical uh, statistical categories. Making ways for the for the NBA, uh, Kevin. How would you describe your game coming out? My game was we would we were taught and trained to be um, basketball players. You know, we weren't a one or two or three. You know, uh, we uh, we talked about being. Uh, I was a swing man, but you know, because um, I played one, two, and three in the NBA, so. Uh, I played some point guard, and when you, uh, my game was, I love the transition, so we got up and down, um, attacking the basket, uh, but I made a living from 20 feet and out, and that was even before the three-point line was was even institute, in, instituted in the, in, the, in the college game. Uh, you, you Tack another nine points on my average, and <laughs> if they had the three point where it is now, because that we call that a layup where they shooting from now. But at any rate, um, it you know um, the game has changed uh, a lot, but um, you know I was I was a uh, you know um, we were inside outside, you know that short game that attacking the basket. Uh, I was a scorer. Um, and you know we had to learn how to defend, so you had to learn how to play on both ends of the of the, of the court. Looking at, I'm looking at, I'm looking at a picture that was posted by GC. Um, it's a it's a picture of you shooting a jumper over um, Dr. J, Julius Irvin. Um, yeah. What what was it like playing against? guys like Dr. J and some of the greats during that time? Um, first of all, uh, Doc was my idol. Um, you know, uh, back during the day, um, when we used to watch TV, there was only one NBA game on on Sunday, and that was uh, uh, the NBA on CBS. So we all gathered around the TV over to whichever friend's house and then we watch that game, and then we would go to the park and we try to emulate what we saw on TV. Uh, getting into the NBA, um, playing against your idol. I remember being in the spectrum. Uh, I'm a rookie. I'm starting. Uh, I'm going up against Doc, and I'm I'm just kind of like uh, melancholy. I'm like up in the clouds, and I'm. And I'm, you know, so I, I hit the wing uh, coming up court, and I hit the wing, and I'm running through the middle. I'm like, wow, I'm in the spectrum, man. I'm playing against Doc, and all of a sudden, um, Steve Mix hits me with a, a forearm shiver, and then Bobby Jones hits me in the back of the head, and then uh, uh, I can't remember if it was Moses or Daryl Dawkins threw me up against the, the back support and said, don't come through here no more, rookie. <laughs> so I was kind of shocked into reality. But after that game, um, I had met Doc in the chapel service prior to the game. And um, he really took, uh, uh, took me under his arm, uh, invited me out. I met his, you know, his, lovely wife turquoise and he uh we went to an italian restaurant and uh we sat at the table of about 25 of his friends and took me to his home afterwards and you know showed me uh a lot of love and um poured into me some wisdom about you know his career and things that he was you know and, and i want to say that he was more impressive as a person than he was as a player. And I had a different uh, a different outlook upon him. Um, but uh, a wonderful memory. And uh, I want to say in that picture that you're looking at, 
uh, I froze him and I drained that jumper. Okay, so that that jumper was money. Okay, so that's all was, I can tell was, you about the rest. It was wet, as they would say. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was wet. <laughs> it was wet. It was all of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we won that night. So yeah, that that night too, we won. And I mean, just looking at the just looking at that draft class, that, that draft class, you got names like Mark Aguirre, Isaiah Thomas, uh, Detroit Pistons, Buck Williams, just the name of name of few. Um, yeah. and, and 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 coming out of Alabama State. Now, at any point, was there? In your heart, was there like this thing of, you know, maybe being intimidated or anything like that, or was it just game on every night? Game on, baby. Uh, let me tell you like this. See, um, Coach Oliver uh, trained us in a mindset that if we execute what we know to do, we ain't got to worry about who we playing against. You no matter what's on your jersey, you know, you can be uh, – Kentucky, you can be UCLA. If we do what we're supposed to do, so that means that every man, every man up, every man up. So, you know, mano a mano. So we competed every day in practice like it was a game. Our greatest games were in practice. So when you come up against whoever it was, you know, they they got to they get you know if they got game, that's great. But you got to guard me too. So. If I do what I'm supposed to do every night, you know, I was never intimidated because the other thing was the mentality to walk into that moment, those big moments against whoever it was that you were playing with, prepared. So it was a mentality of preparation physically and mentally, and that preparation uh, and that time that you put in, when you step into that moment, you're ready. You know, so it don't matter who you're playing against. So, you know, I was never intimidated by that. I was more like I love being the dark horse because, you know, if you tell me that Alabama State don't play against the kind of competition that, you know, University of Alabama did, I was going to show you, okay, here, take some of this because <laughs> we, we knew we could play. We knew we could play against anybody. So, you know, um, it was a mentality that we were prepared for that, uh, you know, we worked very hard to, uh, and when I say excellence, excellence takes more effort. So we put that extra effort in. So when the moment came, we weren't intimidated by anything. The, other, the biggest thing is go out there and execute what you know to do. I, I like to ask this question to former professional players um, because I'm, I'm – um, at times, I've been surprised by the by the answer that they've given me. But um, whether it was in the NBA in college, growing up back in uh, Kasopolis, Michigan, who's the best player you ever played against? <laughs> you know, um, this question comes up a lot, and you know, um, the greatest player. I don't know if you can put anybody in that category and say, you know, one way or the other. I, I can tell you that I played against the greatest players in the world. I can tell you that. Um, but, you know, everybody had, you know, uh, you know, a game, you know, uh, scoring, defending, Block shots, jumping, you know, athleticism. I mean, you know, I played against some of the greats that the 50 greatest. You know, I played against, you know, um, Magic and Kareem and Bernard King and, you know, some of the greats that you all know. So um, I don't really elevate anybody or say the greatest player because. Yeah, you know, I played against some great high school players. That's the why. That's the reason I asked that question is because yeah, yeah, I've yeah. spoken to a lot of people and and they'll give me a name that I've never heard, and they will say that's somebody that they played against, whether it's at Rutgers Park or um, someone that they grew up having battles 
in high school and 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 I guess the point that I was asking or I was getting to is a lot of your greatest players may not have even made made it to the professional level for whatever reasons. There is a guy by the name of Gerald Busby. Gerald Busby is from Buchanan, Michigan. Played against him in high school. Uh, he had a brother named Mike Busby that uh, was my teammate at um, at Kentucky State. And before Steph Curry ever starts shooting from, you know, the, the five-second line, there was Mike Busby that was doing that thing consistently. So... <laughs> But his but but his brother Gerald Busby was all around, and Gerald actually went to Michigan State and uh, was on the same team in '79, early in the season with Magic, the year that they won the national championship and beat uh, Indiana State uh, and Larry Bird in in uh, for the NCAA national championship. But Gerald um, left that team uh, during that year. But he was one of the greatest all-around talents that gave me the blues back in the high school. And I uh, always thought that he would have been um, an excellent NBA player because he had all the gifts and um, was six six. you know, could jump, could shoot, could handle, could pass. And uh, there wasn't anything that he couldn't do early on. And he didn't have uh, – he hadn't even really developed yet. So, you know, he had next level in him. But at any rate, that's uh, that's one of the guys from high school, man, that, that I always thought was one of the greatest players that uh, you never heard of that had next level in him. BG, it never fails. I'm telling you, it's all, I always get a name, or I always thought, to learn about someone that we probably had never heard of. You work your way up through college, and then you you get, you know, your time in the league. But there comes a point in every man's career, athletically, where you have to say goodbye to the player side of the game. W what was that feeling when you when you finally had to transition to another phase of your life? Was it hard to let the game go? Well, the great question, great question, BG, because um. Transition is difficult. Um, if you can imagine um, a relationship that you grow up in the sandlot together, you go to junior high and high school together, fall in love at college, get married, you have great success with someone, and you spend a lot of time with each other. And after having this success and you one day wake up and look at each other and all of a sudden say, I want a divorce. I don't. And so you go on your separate way. It's not a good separation in the fact that there's a lot of um, unresolved feelings because, you know, um, you may be resentful or angry. And so there's a mental health part, a behavioral part that because you, you're you now not only separated, but you may change relationships, meaning that you may see a younger version of yourself with that person that you love. And, you know, that brings up a whole nother level of feelings and emotions. So many of us do not make that transition very easily. Uh, it is uh, difficult for uh, not only professional athletes because we dedicate so much time and effort to our craft, but it's difficult for doctors and lawyers and other people that are very dedicated in their craft and they spend a lot of time in that in that craft for many years, and separation is an identity. So, you know, um, some of us do it better than others, but it is right now in the professional sports area, there's a lot of research, dialogue, and effort being put into transition 
because um, the, the separation cannot always be smooth. Um, and some of us do it better than others. Um, but I'm proud to say that I'm on the other side of it. And, um, you know, um, I'm, you know, uh, proud to be a, a, a father, a, a husband, a father of six adult children, grandfather of 24, two greats. Um, you know, I'm on about four different boards. Uh, I'm vice president of the NBA Retired Players Association. And my most proudest moment is that I'm a I'm a God man. I'm a deacon in my church and church leadership, both my wife and I. So those are things that, you know, uh, prepare you for capacity building, is what I call it, uh, for the next level. You currently are the vice president of the National Basketball Retired Players Association, uh, Houston chapter. Um, in that position, what is your role? Well, we are... Uh, we have about 65 members, uh, about five Hall of Famers. Um, we have three core initiatives. Uh, one is water, uh, where our partner in that uh, space is uh, Project WET. Water Education for Teachers is what WET stands for. They're in all 50 states and 60 countries. Uh, STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Uh, we have three successful STEM partners. We uh, raised revenues for STEM scholarships. And lastly is health uh, and wellness. Uh, kids get fit. And American Diabetes Association is our partner in that space. Uh, we do expos and different things of that particular nature with that education and awareness. Um, we. Uh, Transition uh, into retirement um, is a contribution to society. So you say, why water, why STEM, health and wellness? You know, um, these are areas of education and awareness that we feel our uh, transition from basketball is that we have, we can be a center of influence uh, in the communities that we live in uh, with the children uh, and do education and awareness around the good that uh, through partnerships uh, with, like, you know, we have an MOU with Space Center Houston. Uh, I've been able to do a lot of the business development, and, you know, we have uh, executive advisory board members that I've been able to, you know, lure in from from Boeing, from Dow, from, uh, from the Rockets, uh, you know, so we, you know, we have some community um, programs that we're trying to make an influence uh, and a footprint that is uh, a legacy that is beyond basketball. We can use our um, uh, that NBA brand to uh, bring some awareness and, and good in, in other areas. When you look back on that advice that you got as a as a junior going into your senior year to stay in school and get your degree. Do you think that was uh, good advice that you were given? <laughs> uh, it was beyond good. It was great and it was excellent because my I have a degree in marketing today, uh, minor in management. Uh, I have certification in project management. I've uh, been able to use that education to outperform my earning in NBA, you know, probably 10 times over. It is a sustaining part uh, of my lifestyle. And um, uh, without it, I, I'd hate to, to even discuss where I'd be without the education. So um, it was uh, the single most uh, important and smartest decision I ever made besides accepting Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, Mr. Lyle, thank you for your time. Thank you for your willingness to share with our audience. And we really appreciate having you on the Free Lunch Podcast.
Hey, I appreciate you guys. Uh, continued success. If I can help in any way, let me know. Uh, and uh, the HBCU, swag, swag. <laughs> swag, swag. Can you still shoot it, though? Can you still shoot that thing? The, you know, your, your jump will never leave you. Now, your legs and other things, don't ask me to run up and down. Don't ask me to do a lot of that. But the touch... Uh, that is, you know, it's still flavor. It's still flavor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I appreciate it.